uh, today is a special Grand Rounds, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, our Chief of Neonatology, Yao Sun, to give you a little bit of background about this Grand Rounds and to introduce our speaker. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for um, today's Grand Rounds. As Dr. Hirsch said, um, we really celebrate the legacy of, um, of research and neonatal care here at UCSF on an annual basis. And um, we have a visiting professorship that honors our very first uh, chief of um, neonatology, Dr. William H. Tooley. So I'm gonna speak just a couple of minutes about um, Dr. Tooley and his research legacy in particular, and then I'll introduce our uh, Tooley visiting professor for this year, Dr. Sally Permar. So um, Bill Tooley uh, was a literally a towering figure in neonatology. He stood 6'8", um, and so that was probably one of the first things that anyone noticed about him. But as the first chief of neonatology here at UCSF, he and, and his colleagues really established um, a framework for interdigitating research and clinical care that has set the tone uh, ever since. And as Dr. Roberta Keller said a little bit earlier this morning, he really turned the NICU into a laboratory. And, and he did that literally. So we actually brought, you know, uh, what at that time were called GRASS, a, a brand uh, of um, machines, monitoring, electrical monitor machines into the NICU to record some of the basic physiological uh, measurements that they were interested in, including things like blood pressure and plasmography of respiratory uh, tracings and things like that. So, um, uh, it was a, a, a time of giants and in the time of medicine. So Dr. Tooley, um, Dr. George Gregory, who invented CPAP um, in, uh, in neonates, um, Dr. John Clements, who discovered surfactant. Um, together, they worked in ways um, that advanced both um, clinical and scientific medicine. Uh, they worked on the development of the first uh, artificial surfactant, Exosurf, and did one of the first clinical trials in Singapore. So, so we um, honor Dr. Tooley each year by, um, or, or at least pre-pandemic, we tried to do it annually um, by uh, uh, inviting a visiting professor who kind of epitomizes um, this type of, uh, of research focus um, uh, with also the uh, perspective of how this is gonna help clinical care. And this year um, I'm honored and privileged to uh, introduce Dr. Sally Permar. Um, so Dr. Permar is a professor and chair of pediatrics at Weill Cornell Medicine. Um, she's also the pediatrician in chief of the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical uh, Center. Um, I think many people here at UCSF know her very well in her other role, which is she is the director and principal investigator of the Pediatric um, Scientist Development Program um, from the NIH. Um, Dr. Permar, uh, originally did her undergraduate work at Davidson College, um, and then subsequently actually started her PhD first um, at Hopkins. <clears throat> and in that environment, saw physician scientists who were uh, doing both their lab research and seeing patients. And she thought, wow, wasn't that just a, a great model? And then subsequently <laughs> applied to medical school uh, and attended Harvard Medical School at the same time that she was doing her PhD. Um, if you're interested, you can ask her how she managed to do that. Uh, subsequently, um, did her pediatric residency and uh, infectious disease fellowship at Harvard, was on faculty there for a couple of years before being recruited by Duke University. Um, at Duke, um, she was uh, founder of a physician scientist um, uh, program, um, as well as other programs um, that, no surprise, probably involved development of physician scientists and, and mentoring. Um, and then she was uh, eventually recruited back to, not back, but actually recruited to New York. Um, she has uh, just uh, an incredible uh, academic record. Again, I could literally spend this entire hour talking about her accomplishments. Uh, over 200 publications as an author. Uh, she's currently holds several program project grants as well as um, R01 grants. Um, and uh, one of the things, though, that I found very interesting in terms of her mentoring record is that 75% of her listed mentees are women, and 28% of them are underrepresented in medicine. 
Um, so it's, again, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Permar. She's going to be talking about leveraging early life immunity for long-term vaccine-mediated uh, immunity. I'm sorry, I should have stated her research is in the area of congenital infections, and she's done some seminal work, particularly in the areas of HIV and CMV. So Dr. Permar. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction. And um, despite leaving your notes at home, you did a really great job. <laughs> and um, uh, to Dr. Sun and the entire neonatology division for hosting me this week, I've had a great time. Um, you forget how much fun our job is um, until you're talking to a bunch of trainees and friends and faculty of different levels. There's about collaborations, about mentoring, about our hopes and dreams, and I've had a great time doing it. So, um, so now I'm excited to um, tell you a little more about um, research. I got to talk about um, my, uh, I guess I can call it my favorite virus. They, they, they won't know, um, a cytomegalovirus, um, or the one that I um, you know, am finding myself the most involved in kind of at this stage in my career because of the uh, vaccine efforts is really ramping up now. Um, but I'm going to talk about sort of the other pathogens I've been spending some time on, and especially thinking about how the neonatal immune system is distinct and how we can use the maternal fetal infant interface to design vaccines that um, will protect in the unique ways that, that um, those immune systems have developed. Um, asking to restart the computer, um, and I don't think it's moving, <laughs> sorry. Awesome. So uh, my first slide, though, is about CMV, and that is that I have a number of um, companies that I consult for, which actually I think this slide has provides so much hope because there are this many companies that have active vaccine programs inside of megalovirus, and um, it's, a, it's a growing number, and that's exciting. Um, people see it as a very um, uh, highly needed vaccine. We've uh, only been working on it for 50 years. If they can do SARS-CoV-2 in a year, I think we can have a CMV vaccine at least before we all retire. So that's our goal. Um, but thinking about uh, in just infectious diseases in general, um, being a pediatric infectious disease doctor, um, it is the, the leading cause of uh, global infant deaths. Um, Eight million um, deaths occur across the globe, and about two-thirds of those are attributable to infection. Um, and so uh, some of those we have pretty good vaccines for, like measles. Some we really need um, better vaccines, um, like malaria, where we are just kind of starting, um, uh, other uh, congenital infections like CMV, uh, even um, uh, other causes of sepsis, et cetera. Um, and so this is you know, an ongoing area that, that really is um, in the, um, the prevention is better than treatment kind of realm is um, one of the high, highest yield uh, medical interventions. However, um, as we heard about in the um, earlier uh, Thule Symposium lectures today, Pregnant women and children are often left out of early phase vaccine development. And um, we saw this front and center with the COVID vaccine rollout that never included pregnant or lactating women in the trials, had 30,000 people in the trial. Um, and then it was rolled out without any information to pregnant or lactating women on how that uh, vaccine would be effective or uh, safe in those populations. Um, also, it's a health disparity that children had such delayed access to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And in fact, we saw a concentration of cases um, during the Omicron um, wave in children, and it was because they were the unvaccinated at that point. Maybe y'all saw that in um, San Francisco as well. Um, but we can't just take uh, vaccines that are uh, designed for adults and move them to, into children. Or even we probably shouldn't be doing that for pregnancy either. We should be thinking about how we can rationally design um, to those uh, immune states and, and, and to utilize those unique immune states even for um, driving long-term immunity. There is a ton of um, immunologic shift that happens and um, you know all the uh, neonatologists and pediatricians in the room know this well that um, it's quite amazing that a mother does not reject her fetus and the fetus does not reject the mother for the most part. And um, that the immune system is not uh, born inert as we've been sort of led to believe all these years. 
um, that it actually is um, very good at responding in certain ways early in life and then develops other uh, types of abilities to respond over time. We get maternal, uh, the babies get maternal antibody at birth because um, uh, they have a naive B cell repertoire. However, their B cells are very ready to go when it comes to responding to proteins or other um, good B cell antigens when they need the T cell help. That's where you know, the conjugate vaccines have had to fill in the gaps. Um, but it is, um, uh, we're learning more and more and plenty of people here who are doing this work on learning what are those uniquenesses and how can we use them to our advantage for designing vaccines that are gonna be given in childhood but actually are geared for long-term immunity. The best example of this is hepatitis B. So we give hepatitis B, hopefully at birth, um, uh, most times at birth, um, and then you know a couple of booster doses throughout the first couple of years of life. And for the most part, that provides lifelong protection. And, and it's quite amazing, I think, to, to think about how much good that, that vaccine is doing. And of course, it was very poorly um, uptake vaccine when it was introduced as a vaccine for adolescents who were potentially high risk. Um, the rate of, of um, vaccination went way up as soon as you put it in the hands of uh, pediatricians and uh, neonatologists who got quickly over you know, 80, 90% um, uptake of this vaccine. It's of course given in um, the neonatal period because there's a risk of perinatal uh, hepatitis B acquisition and especially those um, babies that have a mother who has active uh, disease. And so there's actually a passive active combination vaccine that's been developed um, with the HBIG or hyperimmune globulin given uh, to a high risk infant and the active vaccine at the same time. And so if you think about it, you're providing immediate protection and then you're providing lifelong protection right there at birth. And so if all our vaccines could be like this, um, I think we would be much more successful in say getting everybody their COVID vaccine, right? And so there are kind of two strategies that uh, I have uh, thought about over time and, and worked on um, that can really start to harness some of the unique features of the maternal fetal infant um, immune system and immune trafficking to uh, design vaccines that are specific to those time periods, um, as well as thinking about the long-term immunity. So one of those uh, is protective transfer. So this is thinking about um, maternal antibodies, but maternal antibodies in different capacities, not just the IgG that is transferred across the placenta, but also think about the um, mucosal IgA that is uh, specifically traffics to the mucosal areas, including into breast milk. Um, as well as um, antibodies that don't cross the placenta, like IgM. And so how can we use uh, uh, monoclonal antibody engineering that's really exploded over the last few years to think about how to uniquely uh, protect during this vulnerable period? And then the early life immune advantage. So um, there are certain vaccines that um, may actually work better when given in an um, infant immune system, developing immune system com context as opposed to a more fixed adult immune system. Mm -hmm. And we should harness those uh, types of opportunities. And I'm gonna talk about um, challenging vaccine like HIV um, that we're still at the very basic um, biology of understanding and, and learning how we might someday have an effective HIV vaccine. And what does the infant immune landscape bring to that uh, potential challenge? So first talking about protective transfer, and I, I just um, uh, mentioned this a bit, but um, if you think about the you know, uh, evolution of a human immune system and, and to protect um, um, maternal fetal dyad has uh, evolved a number of different um, antibody trafficking mechanisms, which includes, again, the antibodies that don't cross the, pl cross the placenta and stay in, in systemic circulation for the most part, um, like an IgM, um, an IgG that's designed to cross the placenta. And we're learning more and more about that, about how um, there may be differences in um, which antibodies cross the placenta, that it may just not be every antibody that can equally bind to FCRN is going to equally um, have a chance to get across. There may be features like glycosylation, et cetera, that may drive that. And then how uh, antibodies traffic into breast milk through the poly-IG receptor and um, uh, come out as a dimeric IgA. Um, and is that an opportunity to think about um, the different pathogens in the way that they are acquired and at risk during, during this period? Antibodies, of course, have very good safety profiles in pregnancy. We use um, RH factor incompatibility treatment as a um, hyperimmune globulin, as well as um, varicella. So, so good uh, uh, profiles for safety for biologics to build on. Um, 
the last pandemic or, or one of them was um, Zika virus. And of course this took everybody off guard that a flavivirus could be a congenital pathogen. Um, that was not predicted from previous flavivirus work. Um, this um, I like to say is, uh, you know, maybe the, the um, a, a, what caused a lot of uh, stir about, you know, babies being at risk of this new infection. When I compare it to uh, the most common congenital infection, which is cytomegalovirus, this was actually pretty small um, in, in, in comparison. However, there were um, one, about one in 10 women who acquired the um, infection during pregnancy passed the virus onto the baby. Um, and that led to um, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 11,000 cases of microcephaly in that 2015-2016 um, outbreak. Um, led to microcephaly, vision, hearing uh, impairments, neurodevelopmental deficits, some of which are still being realized. And we don't, we're not ready for the next um, uh, Zika outbreak. And of course, you know, as immunity wanes, this, this will be at risk again. And non-pregnant subjects have been performed when really the whole goal is going to be to protect pregnant women against acquisition. Um, so like many pandemic scientists that we're now like becoming better at doing, I think, um, and probably will have to continue to in the future, um, is to act quickly when um, when an uh, outbreak happens and figure out, uh, do you have friends in the area who maybe where the outbreak is occurring? And so this is um, something that, um, that, that I took on and, and luckily was at an institution at Duke that had a number of collaborations going on in Brazil. Um, so we worked with colleague um, Reynaldo Deite, who uh, was in Brazil and had you know, also uh, heard the call to start enrolling pregnant women who were um, faced with the potential of acquiring Zika during pregnancy. Um, one of the hardest things, and I talked about this earlier, is getting um, you know good PBMCs out of uh, uh, especially a global health population. They're expensive to collect and, and uh, takes a lot of skill. Um, but Reynaldo was doing that, and um, so we were able to get some uh, in, uh, PBMCs from um, a population of women that had acquired Zika during pregnancy. And we started to ask the question of, okay, well, what is the difference between women who uh, got Zika during pregnancy and did not pass the, the virus to the baby, or at least not in a way that could be diagnosed as congenital uh, Zika syndrome, uh, versus those that um, had a, uh, apparently a healthy baby. And so we thought, well, maybe the, the B cell repertoire would be something to study. Um, so I had a, um, a very uh, quick moving um, PhD student at the time, Tulika Singh, who's now um, a postdoc in Eva Harris's lab who um, uh, took on this project of taking uh, PBMCs from women who had um, acquired Zika during pregnancy and um, had healthy deliveries versus those that had uh, a baby with, with Zika. And um, Talika will tell you the day that the um, cryo shipper that we sent down to Brazil to bring back um, when we got the news that it had thawed completely in um, customs. And, but, we had luckily had um, at least one successful receipt and so had some of this cohort of PBMCs available. One of them was a very interesting woman who had uh, prolonged virus during viremia during pregnancy, um, where this was uh, only described in pregnant women and actually was replicated in pregnant monkeys, where some women went on to have um, not a just uh, viremia that was cleared after 10 days or so, but um, could last for even months. So we had one woman that, that had viremia for 71 days. Um, and despite having lots of Zika flooding the placenta, she still had a, a healthy baby. Um, and so we isolated the B cells from her. And what came up as interesting, um, uh, and this was, did a memory B cell culture with a colleague, Mattia Bonsignori, who's now at the NIH, um, is um, we found some potently neutralizing uh, antibodies, but they were not IgG, they were IgM. Um, and so we went on to uh, help uh, to further characterize this, um, especially one potent antibody um, that we called um, DH1017. Um, so there's the cute picture of it as a EM, um, as a pentameric and even hexameric structure, which I don't think I knew that before, that IgM could exist as a, a hexamer also. Um, it was the most potent of all the antibodies that were Zika specific that we isolated, um, had the best binding profile, they're shown in red, as well as, um, you know, at least fivefold more potent than other IgGs that we um, isolated, which may make sense for it being a pentamer. Um, interestingly, it also had no cross-reactivity with other with um, other flaviviruses, being dengue as, as one of the most uh, important because of the potential for antibody-enhanced uh, disease 
that is something that a, a Zika vaccine and monoclonals will have to avoid. Um, and then worked with um, a colleague, Richard Kuhn, um, who had done some modeling of the whole Zika virion with antibodies bound. And what was really cool is um, modeled that um, with, with the FAB um, structure, cryo-EM and a whole virion, could see that potentially all of the, of the arms of that pentamer, so actually 10 binding sites, could bind at the same time. And so that is probably has to do with how potent it was. So um, we're actually just doing a study now, trying to look at this in a context of um, treatment in preclinical models, um, being a, a non-human primate model. Um, and you know, you could think about how would an antibody like this be utilized? Well, first, it wouldn't be expected to cross the placenta. And so you wouldn't have to worry too much about um, fetal toxicities. So that I see as a, uh, could be an advantage. Some people say, well, wouldn't you want it to go to the fetus? But Actually, you just want to prevent the mom from becoming infected at all. And so, uh, so maybe it has an advantage there. Um, it could be a pre-exposure um, delivery with, you could think about travelers or women who live in an area of an outbreak or post-exposure, which often monoclonals get, um, get approved at least that way as, as did the COVID monoclonals. Um, and so we're thinking about both of these strategies. Um, and one model that I talked about that, um, that I worked on uh, with others in the non-human primate field here with um, Don Dudley and David O'Connor at Wisconsin to uh, infect pregnant animals and then um, to look at you know, the consequences to the fetus. This is a study that actually was done in non-pregnant animals where we gave hyperimmune globulin. Remember that was you know, the first intervention with COVID also. But with hyperimmune globulin, um, the, the gray animals are the animals that uh, were just given Zika with no prior immunity or intervention. The blue are animals that got nonspecific hyperimmune globulin. So you have to always remember that control because there definitely was an effect. But then in red are the animals that got hyperimmune globulin 24 hours after um, uh, being infected with um, Zika. And so clearly there can be an antibody mediated um, treatment effect that um, now we're looking at with the IgM product also. Moving on to another antibody type, think about uh, dimeric IgA and how could we potentially think about engineering potent um, antibodies that um, as dimeric IgA to um, plan for them to cross over into the breast milk and, and provide some um, protection against enteral um, infections. So uh, the biology of IgA, as many people who think about breast milk immunology know well, is um, that a, uh, um, a dimeric IgA, which we think mostly is probably secreted by local B cells, um, is uh, binds to a J chain on the basolateral side and then uh, traverses through the uh, epithelial cell layer and comes out on the other side as a secretory IgA that carries the J chain with it. Um, the determinants of that interaction is not well known. And you know, if we think about IgG, we've, we've just had a revolution of IgG in modulating how it may interact with its um, uh, canonical receptor, the FCRN. Um, and so you know, there may be opportunities for uh, engineering dimeric IgA as well. Um, but one thing that, um, that I early had, had thought about in non-human primate models is with um, HIV transmission and making breastfeeding safe. Uh, could we think about a monoclonal antibody strategy that would um, essentially allow women to breastfeed and not have the risk of transmission? Antiretrovirals has practically provided that. Um, and in fact, actually, I was just, Ted, Ted Rule, who's probably on the phone, was just, at, was just asking me about um, if I knew any uh, care providers in New York who could coach women who are HIV infected through uh, potentially breastfeeding their babies. Um, but here is a method that may um, uh, potentially make breastfeeding safe for all would be some sort of uh, monoclonal intervention that would specifically uh, deliver the um, breast milk uh, antibodies to breast milk. And uh, this is a study where we took lactating monkeys. And um, one thing, this was actually work that I started in my fellowship time. So for your fellows out there, um, I really wanted to make monkeys lactate without making them pregnant because it took too long to, for them to get pregnant and then you know, uh, collect the milk after that. So we used, um, uh, I just read papers about um, you know, uh, adoptive women who had taken on hormone treatment in order to have some um, uh, ability, non-nutritive suckling type of opportunity. So we designed a, um, a strategy for monkeys and um, it worked a little bit enough for, to, me to measure antibodies that were delivered to these monkeys. So, um, so it was uh, one thing I like to, um, when, we, when we talk about um, special things like we talked about earlier in the um, uh, fun fact, uh, mine is that I can make any monkey lactate even if they weren't pregnant. Um, 
And so, um, but this was a study of comparing um, an IgG broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV with a, um, that's an IgG version versus a mon monoclonal and uh, monomeric IgA versus a dimeric IgA. And looking at which was, um, uh, what, the, what were the kinetics in um, serum and then what got over into breast milk. And um, while each of them had some detection in breast milk, the lowest being the monomeric IgA, dimeric IgA actually had uh, the most persistence and also the highest neutralizing protection. And this was, despite people telling us that um, a dimeric IgA delivered to the systemic compartment would never get into breast milk because maybe it was too, ba too big to get out of uh, the vessels, et cetera, but um, uh, it did in this study. So we then started thinking about it in um, other contexts of infections like um, enter enteric viruses like rotavirus. So um, you all probably know th there's global health researchers out there that the rotavirus vaccine works pretty well in developed countries. It does not work very well in underdeveloped countries, which is where it's, it's really needed to prevent um, early diarrheal deaths. And um, so uh, the um, antibody revolution has been going on in rotavirus as well. And some um, potent neutralizing antibodies against rotavirus have been isolated. Um, including uh, the Harry Greenberg group that isolated monoclonal antibody 41, um, which was uh, originally an IgA, um, and it was isolated from IgA uh, secreting cells in the intestine. It's VP4 specific, neutralizes both in vitro and in vivo, and is um, the uh, blue line there um, as a, a potent neutralizer. Um, Stephanie Langle, who uh, was previously in my group, now a um, faculty member um, in at, um, Columbus, is uh, uh, produced it as a dimeric IgA, which um, we always said, this is probably the cutest antibody. I don't know, it like dances a little. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, designed a study to give it to mice. But we didn't know if in this, you know, we had seen it in monkeys, but would it happen in mice too, that a dimeric um, systemically administered IgA, would it, would it make it to mucosal compartments? And um, it did, um, it, you know, the kinetics need to be worked on because it was pretty low. But um, with two different doses here, the um, highest dose, 15 mg per kg, um, did have detection in uh, breast milk that was, um, you know, uh, waned quickly. Um, uh, a five milligram also um, was um, uh, had some detection in in breast milk as well. Um, but also, we could find it in the um, in the pup uh, stomach contents as well. Um, so we then uh, went with a challenge study that, uh, you know, was done on a, a short timeline because uh, the kinetics of this were, um, uh, again, still need to be worked on. Um, and so we gave a, um, a five milligram per kilogram monoclonal antibody infusion to a mouse postpartum and then um, challenged the, dan the pups um, six hours after that injection. And then 24 hours later looked for diarrhea as well as um, uh, uh, did necropsy to look for um, the viral antigen. Um, and uh, what we saw is that we could see a significant reduction in the incidence of diarrhea, which is you just squeeze the pups and see if anything comes out um, that's liquid or solid. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, there was a reduction there and then also a reduction in the antigen detected in the viral load. Um, so, uh, so this is um, work that we've, it, this was uh, actually, uh, Stephanie um, was one of those people that had to sack her mice in the COVID pandemic. <laughs> and um, uh, so we have now done the repeat you know, however many years later, and uh, and are working on uh, showing that that the, the same effect was seen within a repeat uh, study. Um, so uh, potentially, those um, strategies with um, designing antibodies that are targeting specific uh, epidemiology of the virus infection at the maternal, fetal, and infant interface is a strategy that we could see for the future for um, protection that's really designed for the uh, pregnancy period. But then thinking about um, the um, active vaccination, so uh, the early life immune advantages. So again, we've sort of, uh, the, the textbooks would say that the um, neonate is um, immunologically deficient, but actually the neonate is just immunologically different. And so um, uh, how can we help harness those types of responses that infants are good at that you may lose the ability to, um, to be as good at as you uh, evolve your immune system into adulthood? Um, so one of those that um, I think is a big opportunity and, and one that I um, now spend a, a number of years working on is thinking about pediatric HIV vaccination. Uh, the epidemiology of the HIV pandemic does um, lend itself to uh, strategies that would um, protect infants passive, po possibly through passive immunization, again, with the um, uh, 
the explosion in broadly neutralizing antibody technologies um, with that, um, uh, the time period, the temporary time period during which an infant is at risk, either in utero, um, uh, around delivery or through breastfeeding. Um, and, and that's you know, still a lot of infections, 400 uh, a day of um, infant infections are happening and half of those through breast milk now. Um, but then there's a period of essentially no um, HIV exposure risk. Um, uh, once weaning happens and until sexual debut, that's actually uh, could be a great time in which you wanna elicit the immunity that's gonna be needed to protect um, starting in sexual debut and then through, uh, through uh, the rest of their life. Um, and so, uh, uh, and actually our adolescents are um, a, a major high risk population right now. The, um, they're one of the populations that continues to have rise in mortality, um, keeping them in care and on antiretrovirals. Those who work with adolescents know uh, can be a challenge. Young women uh, are infected more often than their male counterparts. And um, of course this cycles back into pediatric HIV because young women who are um, uh, pregnant or lactating are often included in this um, uh, adolescent and young uh, female group. Um, but this is epidemiology that lends itself to potential of a passive and active combination that then will uh, traverse uh, you know, immunity across the lifespan. Um, and so uh, now there are trials ongoing with broadly neutralizing antibody delivery to infants and uh, at least protecting through the um, breastfeeding period and some cost-effectiveness studies that in areas of high risk, that would be um, uh, cost-effective. But then one area that, that I've been focusing on with colleagues is the potential for introducing uh, multi-dose vaccination that we know is gonna uh, require multiple doses for an HIV vaccine because of all the B cell evolution that has to occur in order to reach those broadly neutralizing antibodies being actively elicited uh, without uh, the setting of infection. So, um, and how we know that this uh, might be more uh, possible in an infant immune system and developing immune system is looking at the immune um, responses in HIV infected children compared to that of HIV infected adults. And it, uh, now several investigators, including my colleague, um, Jenny Fuda has reported um, that it is, um, happens more quickly that, um, that infants who are HIV infected um, can develop neutralizing antibodies within one to two years after infection. In adults, it was always seen as something that happens three or later years after infection. And then um, in adults, it only happens um, about 20% of the time. And we're finding that over half of infected infants will go on to have this response. Another key um, uh, underlying principle is that possibly there are less somatic mutations required in the antibodies that become broadly neutralizing antibodies um, compared to those in adults. Um, this is one of the uh, reasons why it's, it's so challenging to make an HIV vaccine is in order to make those broadly neutralizing antibodies that are clearly needed because a lot of T-cell based vaccine uh, trials have not gone well um, is the, um, the B cells that make those broadly neutralizing antibodies are often highly uh, somatically hypermutated, up to 20, 25 mutations even. And that is an unusual type of antibody and often antibodies that are even have autoreactive pro uh, properties. And um, so it's thought that maybe the B cell tolerance mechanism are actually deleting those types of hyper, hyper mutated antibodies. And um, in an um, infant immune system, maybe the tolerance mechanisms are different, and maybe even the uh, rate at which the somatic hypermutation happens per each amino acid is distinct. And so, uh, so this is something that um, also indicates that it could be easier to elicit those broadly neutralizing antibodies in infancy. Um, and, it's, and again, it's gonna have to be a multi-dose vaccination because I think we realize how much evolution of the B cells have to occur that um, uh, just won't be achievable in a couple of vaccine doses with current vaccines. So the um, uh, strategies that are being applied now is B cell lineage designed HIV envelope vaccines. And there's um, some bright lights of success going on. Um, so this is based on taking a, um, uh, native-like HIV envelope proteins, um, now called SOSIP trimers, and don't even try to think about what SOSIP stands for because it is not even an acronym. So we just call it that in the HIV field. So SOSIP uh, uh, native-like trimer um, that is um, then uh, uh, genetically modified or, or modified uh, the, the, the conformational structure to bind better to certain uh, 
uncommon uh, or common ancestors of the B cell lineages that can develop into broadly neutralizing antibodies. So this uh, vaccine, a BG505 SOSIP trimer that actually uh, was designed from a virus that was originally acquired by a baby, that's the BG, probably a baby girl. Um, the uh, mutations were made in the um, structure at the binding sites of um, broadly neutralizing antibodies for better engagement with those B cell lineages. Um, including CD4 binding site antibodies, as well as um, to the variable loop one and two apex. And so we studied in infant monkeys um, whether uh, if you vaccinate uh, with a wild type trimer that just came straight from the virus versus a uh, B cell lineage designed trimer that is um, designed to better engage those uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, would be better at inducing uh, at least the precursors of broadly neutralizing antibodies. The study led by Ashley Nelson, um, who um, uh, just recently moved to Weill Cornell as a faculty, um, uh, led this study. And so we did priming immunizations with a protein uh, and, and here with a potent adjuvant, which is a TLR78 agonist um, that in other studies we had shown was really well suited to an uh, infant immune landscape to elicit high uh, binding antibody magnitude. Um, we gave three priming doses with the B cell lineage design trimers and followed with the wild type trimer after that. We found that both of the um, uh, immunizations were um, immunogenic, could elicit high magnitude IgG responses. And, um, and you can see we gave multiple doses over time that we really designed to fit into an uh, EPI type uh, under five vaccine schedule with multiple uh, vaccines in the first couple months of life, kind of that two, four, six type of um, approach and then um, annual vaccines after that. And so did this um, monkeys age a little faster than, um, than humans about three times faster. And so we think of a, a, a sexually mature monkey is around 3.5 years of age. So, um, so that uh, is kind of the, the immunization period we've been taking advantage of. But what um, was um, uh, interesting is that in the animals that got the B cell lineage design trimer, they're shown in green, um, had similar ability to neutralize the virus that um, matched the, uh, the vaccine strain, which is about as, as far as HIV vaccination has gotten so far, is you can elicit autologous virus neutralization. But we really want, and you really need the heterologous virus neutralization, the broad neutralization. So then in HIV uh, world, we do a lot of these multi uh, uh, variant neutralization assays, and we've narrowed down, uh, lots, of, lots of work has gone into narrowing down panels that represent the global diversity. And um, a lot of these heat maps that show no color, this heat map has a little bit of color. <laughs> so a little bit of induction of ability to neutralize multiple global variants of HIV, but only coming from the group that got the B cell lineage design trimer. Um, and, and, and another uh, assay that we did developed by um, David Montefiore's group at Duke is to be able to look to see if precursors of certain types of neutralizing antibodies are developing that you can detect them in plasma. Um, they are not yet fully mature and therefore able to uh, mediate the same level of neutralization as the uh, broadly neutralizing antibody monoclonal itself. Um, but um, we can use um, uh, virus variants that are slightly more susceptible to neutralization, like through glycan deletion, and then also uh, make mutations in the important epitope, like the CD4 binding site epitope. And so here we saw that three monkeys, uh, the same three that had the uh, little bit of heterologous neutralization, um, had evidence of a uh, broadly neutralizing antibody precursor against the CD4 binding site that went away when you, uh, when you mutate that uh, epitope. Um, so we had two animals that did not have the response and none that were in the wild type um, uh, vaccine group. Then one of my newest favorite techniques uh, being applied in vaccinology now is cryo-EM polyclonal antibody mapping. Um, this being done at Scripps by Andrew Ward's group and Gabe um, Orzowski um, here did these studies is um, being able to take the antigen that you immunize the animals with um, they uh, incubate it with the polyclonal plasma and then are able to image where you see antibodies binding. Um, and so they're able to then take all of the potential important epitopes of broadly neutralizing antibodies and show um, what was induced in the plasma. And um, the dark blue is the CD4 binding sites. We see those same three animals have that response, maybe even a fourth that we're not picking up on our plasma assays. Um, and then there are other interesting epitopes um, that could be targets of 
um, broadly neutralizing antibodies being induced here as well, like the fusion peptide, as well as the, um, the uh, C3V5 uh, interface as well. And um, we took the opportunity then to compare these infant monkeys who got a similar reg uh, regimen in adult monkeys. They got um, a, a little bit different regimen where the infants got one additional dose, but otherwise had um, very similar regimens in uh, these infants and adults. Um, we have five animals in each, which is like not a bad group size for uh, monkey studies. Um, but uh, what we saw is that one uh, of the adult animals that got the same regimen had that CD4 binding site precursor response, whereas three of the infants. Um, so maybe, maybe it's more. And uh, we're, we're actually just got an NOA to potentially uh, uh, increase these, these uh, group sizes to my uh, colleague, Christina de Paris. Um, so, uh, but then looking at that cryo EM polyclonal antibody mapping, um, you can see again the difference in um, a germline B cell designed trimer that um, it can induce more of the epitopes we care about in more animals compared to um, uh, the wild type design. But then I think what's really interesting is showing the difference uh, with adults. And this is where potentially we're getting the picture that the adult uh, B cell repertoire is less flexible than the infant uh, B, uh, B cell repertoire, where um, you have uh, potentially more infants responding to more of the epitopes than adults um, and included in both of these uh, regimens, either the germline targeting or the wild type designed uh, plasmid. And so uh, conclusions from this is potentially a multi-dose immunization regimen that's started in infancy um, with a B-cell lineage design um, native-like SOSA trimer for uh, HIV could be a promising strategy to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies actively, maybe at the same time as passively delivering the, um, the broadly neutralizing antibodies that are gonna protect the infant um, before weaning. And then that would be a strategy to provide uh, long-term immunity before adolescence. Maybe you could even boost uh, around the time we give an HPV vaccine to make sure that immunity is there when going into that really high-risk period of um, adolescence. And this is actually the basis of a uh, clinical trial that's ongoing now, a phase one study um, that the HIV Vaccine Trials Network um, is performing of a B-cell lineage design, so subtrimer being delivered as a phase one uh, clinical study in infants who are exposed to HIV. So, uh, so more to come from human studies as well. And I'm gonna end on SARS-CoV-2 um, since we all uh, are, uh, you know, still have fresh memories of that. And I talked about earlier that, um, you know, we were lucky, right? That um, uh, children were not as highly affected as um, adults and elderly adults in particular. Um, it did not have that typical bathtub um, uh, shape uh, epidemiology curve where you have the most severe disease with most respiratory viruses in early life and in late life. It kind of, you know, was mostly skewed to the later life. Um, but as children became the under vaccinated group and you can argue they still are, um, is uh, we saw more disease happening in, uh, in the youngest children. Um, and so uh, early on in the pandemic, you, could, you knew that if children were gonna be left out of vaccine development. And in fact, um, uh, they were, and the late um, um, approval of an infant vaccine, I think is, is, is somewhat contributing to the low uptake that we've seen as well. Um, but we were, had those infant HIV vaccine studies going in non-human primates in infant models. And um, we wanted to see, could we speed the, um, the introduction of the vaccine into um, uh, infants by having a relevant preclinical model that at least could establish dosing and, and what type of regimen would be ideal. The um, uh, luckily worked with Moderna to be able to get access to a preclinical version of their uh, prefusion S vaccine, as well as work with the Vaccine Research Center on the group uh, that did develop the prefusion S that really came from SARS CoV 1 work. Uh, Barney Graham, Jason McClellan were the ones that um, had already established what was the uh, trimeric structure of the S protein that would best bind to antibodies, kind of like we were just talking about with HIV, except it was much easier <laughs> with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so uh, we took the, uh, the same type of regimens that we had been giving in HIV, uh, SOSIP envelope trimers, uh, to have the same protein doses, as well as um, adjuvant that works really well in infants, that um, TLR78 agonist or the 3M052 agonist. So we uh, gave this to infant monkeys, uh, two doses, uh, four weeks apart, and then studied them for a year uh, after uh, giving it to them. 
Uh, what we saw is very good um, neutralizing responses that were um, elicited in the infants and lasted a pretty long time. Um, we uh, here was a neutralization of the actual live variant done by um, Ralph Barrick's lab. Um, and we saw induction of um, uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells as well with um, the mRNA having a um, stronger ability to elicit uh, CD4 T cells than a protein vaccine um, that had been described for mRNA as well. But um, the protein vaccine shown in blue did uh, have induction of both CD4 and CD8 T cells that were specific for the S protein as well. And then um, uh, after a year of vaccination, did uh, work on a challenge of these animals, uh, which at, at that point, the Delta, Delta was king. And um, so uh, challenged them with a heterologous virus to the, um, the D64G wild type that we had given them the vaccine to match, the same vaccine we all got. Um, and uh, so challenged with uh, the Delta variant of these two, um, two groups of infant monkeys. And what we found is that in the protein immunized animals that did have slightly higher magnitude um, antibody responses, um, that's where we saw a reduction in the virus replication in the nasal swabs, which again, um, the vaccines being completely sterilizing was probably an unrealistic um, expectation. So, but reducing virus load um, is, is um, likely a, a important effect as well. And then really what matters, the lung um, pathology here with an intratracheal challenge, um, we showed that the um, uh, amount of pathology could be significantly reduced with any vaccine, um, but actually was the most reduced with the protein vaccine um, that again, uh, elicited the strongest neutralizing antibodies that, um, that uh, because they were higher magnitude, uh, waned less over that year. Um, there were a couple of animals with mRNA vaccination who did have some disease um, in the lungs that they um, were the ones you would have predicted had the lowest neutralizing antibodies left at the time of challenge. So um, able to show that, and I, I, I didn't talk about this, but we did um, give a lower dose to the infants, both the mRNA and the protein than the adults were giving. So that low dose um, vaccination, uh, you know, that then played out in the human clinical trials to be able to go down to low dose, which did reduce the toxicities in children, um, was uh, safe and highly immunogenic. B cells in babies are very ready to go in responding to protein. And so this is an advantage we should you know, use in infant vaccination is to reduce the toxicity by reducing doses. Um, they both induced uh, durable plasma spike specific antibodies that could neutralize, but the protein vaccine uh, decreased the nasal virus replication as well as the um, pathology in the lungs to a Delta virus challenge, um, slightly better than the mRNA vaccine. So possibly uh, we should be using a different vaccine construct in, in infants. Um, but uh, I think if we just get them all mRNA, that'll be a good start. Um, so just summing up as to um, how we can really start to think about designing vaccines that are specific for the maternal infant dyad is to think about covering the, uh, the, infant of win of, um, the window of infant vulnerability. Um, you, you can't vaccinate at this point before uh, you know, the baby is born. And so you're gonna have a window in which um, there is not vaccine elicited immunity present in that baby. And so delivery of um, preformed antibodies like uh, the monoclonal um, antibody approaches. Now the RSV vaccine or Sevamib set to come out um, uses this opportunity. Um, but how could we also think about delivering antibodies that are gonna traffic into the compartment that is most important for that infection, like trafficking into breast milk or staying in the systemic compartment when you only need to protect the woman against acquisition. Um, then leveraging early life immunity for long-term um, uh, immunity to protect against uh, the next pandemics. So uh, designing vaccines that not only are specific for the infant immune system, but also utilize the uniquenesses to elicit responses that may not even be elicit elicitatable in um, a more fixed adult um, immune system. And so this is where I hope vaccine technology will take us in the near future. And um, I appreciate um, first all my collaborators. This is a ton of work and, um, and, and really a lot of work on um, uh, developing scientists that, um, you know, take on these projects and really um, uh, make them their own and then become, uh, you know, uh, proponents themselves for uh, this, this type of work and vaccinating these vulnerable populations, um, as well as all the primate centers that uh, work with us, also um, our collaborators in the vaccine development and um, uh, the NIH for, for most of this funding. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Um, so, given the different 
techniques that you've talked about so far. What's the timeline do you think for the next pandemic in terms of recognition of the actual vector having and, and cases seeing that the FDA might do an emergency use approval or some other mechanism? Specifically for infant or pregnant women or? <laughs> um, okay, well, I can do that one. Um, yeah, so I think the record has been set now, right? With, with COVID and uh, so that was less than a year. Um, well, we're going to need faster um, because I, I, we shouldn't, you know, um, kid ourselves that we're not looking at another pandemic literally anytime. Um, so I think we're only going to see faster pandemic um, occurrences. Sorry, should I ask you to repeat the question for our... Oh, sure, sure. Um, so the question was, how, what is the um, timeline for the next pandemic? Uh, when the next pandemic occurs, what would be the um, expected timeline for a new vaccine approval? Um, and I, I am uh, right at this moment writing a very large grant all about this. And so I have a lot of thoughts right now. <laughs> um, and, and that's good because that means the, um, our funding agencies are actually putting money behind this because I think we're very behind um, with those uh, viruses of high pandemic potential. And, and what I'm always amazed by is how frequently they are more severe in pregnancy um, and there will be uh, um, pathogens that are more severe in infants. Um, like I'm writing a lot about uh, a human parainfluenza virus that um, if a new serotype of uh, uh, HPIV comes out, babies will certainly be um, high risk there. So um, I think the record has been set with, uh, you know, less than one year to an mRNA vaccine development. mRNA is clearly king when it comes to uh, quickly taking a sequence and just feeding in a prototype uh, type of vaccine for how quickly it could be manufactured. It has limitations like maybe um, uh, how long lasting is the immunity as well as it requires cold chain still. Um, so those things need to be worked on. Um, so, so, you know, we wouldn't want to count out the other uh, types of vaccine platforms. Protein vaccines are hard, I think, to develop uh, quickly. And so that is, is going to be a limitation going forward, but maybe something that you should have the mRNA quickly produced, but then, you know, move to the one that's going to elicit longer term immunity um, as another strategy. Um, and uh, having uh, these prototype vaccines where can you take vaccines and develop for viruses we already know, show that they work, and then uh, make uh, when that new sequence of a new variant comes out that, um, you know, is a mimic of, of the vaccine you already have, you can just change the sequence and quickly produce a prototype at least to have in place. So I think, uh, you know, 90 days is kind of the, the goal. Uh, and so, um, and, and also we're involved in some pandemic preparedness work sampling children throughout New York City um, to just have on the shelf um, some monoclonal antibodies against things that they are seeing now uh, working on uh, intravirus D68 as trying to catch kids that, um, that have recently had that infection, even if they don't show up on our wards with um, AFM, uh, you know, what, what was the immunity like and can we isolate antibodies that, that would be on the shelf and ready for um, an outbreak of a similar virus? Um, now there's a lot of people, but you know, In the room, yeah. So um, I'm gonna get your thoughts on um, engineering antibodies or passive transfer. My question is informed by experience from my own lab where we use bispecific animals to target stem cells to an LAD ligation model of cardiac injury, and it worked. Mm -hmm. So um, would, it, would a, a reagent with two, two monoclonals conjugated at the, on their backside on the caboose be a potent reagent? Have you thought about things like that? Yes. So the question was about bispecific antibodies, and could that um, be a tool for um, vaccination or pandemic? A more potent? Yes, exactly. So absolutely. Um, the um, either way, if you think about maybe getting some breadth with being able to um, pair the fab of two different antibodies, or whether you make a more potent because now you have um, maybe two valencies exactly. Um, then that would be um, uh, could be desirable. Um, we'd have to think about those, don't, those. That wouldn't have a FC region, right? So it wouldn't have an FC region. So that may be an antibody that would be designed to stay in the maternal systemic circulation, which could be an advantage. I mean, like uh, for CMV, my favorite virus. Um, maybe we just need to prevent maternal acquisition. Uh, we don't we don't have to worry about whether it gets across the placenta if mom never gets it in the first place during pregnancy. So that could be, um, and same with Zika, 
um, that could be an approach. So yes, bispecific antibodies, definitely um, of interest. Mary. Um, thank you, wonderful talk. Um, I particularly appreciated how you said, you know, COVID and how children are not, not unexpected. Um, how, with the next pandemic, how do we as pediatricians, you know, continue to, to push uh, that, you know, kind of public health information and uh, push forward to make sure that children aren't left behind again in the next pandemic? Um, you know, we have a lot of great data here, but you know, that public health policy and information just seems to be exciting. Yeah, so the, the um, I love that question, <laughs> that um, how can we not leave children behind in the next pandemic, add pregnant women in there as well with uh, the vaccine development. And um, that is something I thought about a lot. I was just like, got angrier and angrier throughout the years, <laughs> more than a year waiting for that uh, childhood vaccine to be approved. So um, uh, what I did with that, when, whenever something makes you upset, you should probably like do a research study on it, right? So, uh, <laughs> so that's what I tried to do. So, and uh, I guess, in, you know, through the years of being a basic scientist, sometimes things just take too long and you want to make a policy change. <laughs> and so I have dipped my toe in the policy uh, arena because it, you did realize there, there, the FDA approval process, it, it does not fare well for uh, early inclusion of children. And if you ask the industry, why didn't you include children earlier, they'll say FDA. And if you ask the FDA, they'll say it was the companies. So, you know, obviously we need to change the incentives. Um, so, uh, so we do, maybe I may add you to the list of people we're going to interview, but we're doing this like <laughs> widespread interview of different experts of what, what needs to change for um, early inclusion of, of children, um, as well as pregnant women. And actually they have two very different needs. So we're actually gonna end up, I think, writing two different white papers on this. But uh, one thing that we proposed in, in childhood is you need that dose ranging. And so can you do that in preclinical models? infant monkeys would be my choice, but you know, they're expensive. And so there may be uh, other models we should prove mirror humans really well, and then use those. Um, can we do toxicity studies that are more relevant? One thing we think about with um, uh, pregnancy is all these organoid technologies. Can we do toxicity studies that um, are more relevant maybe than rats? And, and then, you know, start to de-risk, um, including pregnant women in, in trials. Um, we need to work on incentives. Um, the, uh, Minimal risk allowed in pediatric studies is helpful. You don't have that for pregnant women. That probably needs to change. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that need to change. And honestly, if it, people like us don't do it, it's not going to happen. And that's what I have realized time and time again as I started to do more advocacy is if only someone had done this years ago, it probably would have changed already. And so don't underestimate the power of advocacy and whatever you do, because um, only people who really care a lot have to you know, uh, put their effort into it. San Francisco is the home of Africa. That's, that is true. The whole reason we have uh, all the, the treatments for HIV, bringing up advocacy with HIV and ACT UP, and, and New York was probably the other uh, epicenter. Um, and the reason that the uh, NIH still prioritizes HIV research is advocacy. And um, so if children don't have voices and we are the voices for children. And so uh, don't underestimate uh, the power of that in your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a Few days here, was it on my other part? So I appreciate that. <clears throat> my question is um, related to uh, vaccine hesitancy. You know, one of the one of the unfortunate consequences of the pandemic we've all just been through is the increase in suspicion uh, of vaccination in general, and of course uh, for children that's especially problematic. has had on improving survival of morbidity in children. Uh, but this, what used to be a fringe kind of group in the society that was anti-vaccine has become much more dominant now. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how we as pediatricians can address that challenge with our patients that we don't care. Yes, so the question was on vaccine hesitancy, which I totally agree is humbling in that you can make the best vaccine, but if nobody gets it, it's not gonna be effective. So, so uh, this is something, yeah, it snuck up on us with um, you know, uh, uh, social media uh, becoming the way people communicate, um, but we have to, we have to work to, to fight back on it. Um, and I think um, education campaigns alongside vaccine development needs, needs to happen. So we need to think about early stage vaccine development as education, 
and um, communication as well as much as the basic science almost. So I think that's social science that needs to uh, move forward and, and you know, um, also involves policy, et cetera. Um, as pediatricians, obviously we are the front line. I don't think we do a good job right now training pediatricians how to combat vaccine hesitancy. I don't know at least of, um, uh, you know, sort of standard teaching around that even. And, and I think we probably need to do that. And, and in fact, um, I uh, ha have worked a little bit with the ABP in the last year to look at their QI. They had QI, a lot of it around COVID vaccine uptake, flu vaccine uptake, but none around just routine vaccines. And um, so we, and we had a polio uh, case in New York City this year, and we have areas of the city that only have 70% vaccination rate of their under fives. So um, uh, we started thinking about, well, what's our polio vaccine rate? And then shockingly, it was not over 95%, like it should be. And so we should be making sure that all of our uh, frontline pediatricians are um, encouraged and, you know, um, uh, have um, ways to incentivize them to look at their vaccination rates and, and do those uh, improvements, but also training in how to talk to families. I think there's a science of that that has been developing and pediatricians still win out as the, uh, the most listened to and effective. Um, but I don't know that we're training our, um, our uh, pediatricians and how to do that ideally. So, so I do think pediatricians are gonna be a big part of that, but we, the, we need the sort of uh, systems and the policies to uh, promote that as well. And then I think the, the social science research and communications research to be seen as just as important as the basic science. So I know we are um, at time right now. Um, Dr. Marcel, I'd like to have a few minutes for anyone who wants to um, come up and ask questions. But I want to thank you very much again for being our visiting Julie professor. Come to San Francisco anytime. I had a great time. <laughs> so for anyone who's um, being part of the research